so our theme for this ongo is um, practicing non-knowing intimacy with self, other, and world. And I'm going to have some um, intentionality around uh, breaking up the ongo period, the three-month period, into those three themes, right? Self for the first month, other for the second month, and world for the third month. And so my, my talks will be focused on that. And I've kind of got uh, a koan for each one of those three that will help to frame uh, my sharing around those three different aspects of practice. Each month is gonna look like, um, I'll give out of each of the four weeks, um, I'll give two Dharma talks and a show in will give one Dharma talk. And then the fourth one will be a group sharing on the specific non-knowing theme of that month. So in four weeks from now, it'll be a group session and people, everyone can share your practices of non-knowing of self for the first month and then non-knowing of other for the second month and world for the third month. Okay. So I think that's um, it's a nice way to just give a little bit of a structure you know, to the Yango period. And I've had several people share that they're, they're gonna apply that to their own practice, you know, really, really closely. So I invite you to do that if you'd like to have that focus through the course of the, the next three months or, uh, but you don't have to, it's just a way of working with it. Yeah. <clears throat> These three, um, they're very uh, interconnected. Yeah. Um, because our Zen understanding is that self is not separate from other, is not separate from world, that truly it is the one body that is alive in each moment. They're really just different ways of working with the same thing. So not knowing of self is one angle in, not knowing of other is another angle in, but it's the same thing. And not knowing world, intimacy with world is uh, another angle in. So it's really a, it's really a rich uh, overall subject and it's not, um, it's one theme. Yeah, I just wanna, I just wanna appreciate the, the, the unity of the theme. It really is the one investigation, okay. Okay, welcome Amy and Arthur. Just take a little moment. Okay, okay so we'll go into our uh, initial uh, <clears throat> meditation period and we'll go a little bit longer. Let's go till 20 after. So we'll do a 12 minute period and just, um, Really connect with your body, your posture, pay meticulous attention to your inner experience of body, space, sensation. Okay. Bring your attention this to the feeling and to the hearing senses. Shift away from the verbal senses, you know, all those words going on in your head and the visual sense, okay? Deactivate, neutralize the visual sense. And don't dwell so much in the verbal. And really move into absorption, into the oral sense, the hearing sense and the feeling sense, okay. Practice this way. <clears throat> Feel free to relax your posture if needed. <clears throat> Make yourself comfortable. We'll share some Dharma words. <clears throat> non-knowing, practicing non-knowing, practicing
practicing non-knowing intimacy with the self. <clears throat> so we have these three aspects of non-knowing or practicing intimacy that we'll be working with, non-knowing intimacy with self, intimacy with other, and intimacy with world. The root koan or the root question for non-knowing practicing intimacy with the self is who am I? The root question for non-knowing other is who are you? And the root question for non-knowing of world is what's that? <laughs> so we have some nice koans which really uh, express these three questions. So I'll take up this first one now because we're, we're looking at non-knowing self, intimacy with the self. Okay, so I'll um, talk about two specific kind of koans that we have in our tradition and um, most of you have heard of these before and uh, I'm also going to be uh, re repeating some of the words that I shared at the session back on, on Saturday so some of you who are, who are there on Saturday might hear a little resonance of what I shared there, but we have a bigger group today and uh, I'll, I'll try to throw a twist in perhaps so it uh, remains interesting for you. Yeah. So um, the um, legendary founder of, of Buddhism is a figure called Bodhidharma who was an Indian sage who um, had an awakening experience with his teacher who was an Indian teacher and was uh, destined, you know, in, in dreams, his teacher realized that he was fated, Bodhidharma was fated to travel to China and to uh, share this per a particular form of Buddhism with, with the Chinese. And uh, sure enough, according to the legend, this, this figure, who we call Bodhidharma, traveled to China and um, introduced a certain form of Buddhism there, which became Zen. So there's, there's some question as to whether Bodhidharma was a real person or not. He might have been a legendary person. Uh, a legendary person, what's a legendary person? A fiction, perhaps. Um, but the, the, way, the way I see it, and I think many others see it this way too, is there, there is enough kind of coherence and internal consistency to the figure of Bodhidharma and to the message and the expression and the teachings of Bodhidharma and to the influence of Bodhidharma as others in subsequent years and centuries referred back to the things that were said at this time, that it makes plenty sense just to work with the archetype that has come down to us. <clears throat> as much as we, we consider Shakespeare to be a person even though there's ample evidence that it perhaps was not the person we think he was. Our, our poet and English professor is chuckling over here and I don't know whether you think that's, that's insane or whether you think maybe this is okay. Oh my, the owl has an opinion on that. <laughs> Are we okay? Are we still? Okay. Are we still being heard on, online? Okay, very good. Um, yeah, so according to the lore, this Indian sage traveled to the court of the emperor of China and uh, had an exchange and really, um, really threw him for a loop with, with uh, Bodhidharma's responses to his questions. So uh, I, won't, I won't go into the earlier ones, some of you know them, but, but the, the emperor was so um, confused because the form of Buddhism that he appeared to be presenting was radically different from the Buddhism that he, that he understood, um, that he said, who are you? Who is this standing before me? And Bodhidharma re responded, I don't know. <clears throat> so this is, this is the primary expression of the non-knowing that we're um, practicing ourselves. Okay. Bodhidharma basically, it's like, well, who are you? So it's like, who am I? <laughs> who am I? His answer to who am I was, I don't know. <clears throat> that's, that's the root question right there. 
<clears throat> the root question for non-knowing self. Who am I? <clears throat> now, it's kind of interesting because that question sort of uh, unfolds kind of like a tree. If Who am I is the root question, but then we have some, if we envision that as like a tree, that now we've got some boughs that are uh, related questions about the self. And can we bring non-knowing to those questions in the same sort of way? So some of those questions are, why are you doing what you're doing? What's really important to you? Why did you do that? Okay. These are also deep questions. You know, not ultimately maybe as radically deep as who am I? That's the root question, but also very deep questions. <clears throat> and now we have another koan which touches on these questions. <clears throat> Jizo's not knowing is most intimate. Master Jizo asked Hogan, where have you come from? I pilgrimage aimlessly, replied Hogan. What is the matter of your pilgrimage? asked Jizo. I don't know, replied Hogan. Not knowing is the most intimate, remarked Jizo. And at that, Hogan experienced great enlightenment. <clears throat> Now the appreciatory verse to this koan, which comes right after the main case. I just want to share this too, it's very nice. Right now, investigation replete, it's the same as before. Utterly free from minute obstacles, one comes to not know. Short is short, long is long. Cease pruning and grafting. According with high, according with low, each is even and content. A family's manner of abundance or thrift is used freely according to circumstances. Fields and lands, excellent, sportive, one's feet go where they will. The matter of 30 years pilgrimage, a clear transgression against one's pair of eyebrows. Now, there's, there's a couple of really nice turns of phrase here that I want to focus on. Utterly free from minute obstacles, one comes to not know. Short is short, long is long. Cease pruning and grafting. The pruning and grafting, what is that? It's shaping your life to accord with your ideas of your life, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Oh, this, I don't like this part. Let's cut this off. <laughs> oh, I want to be a better person. I want to be more educated or I want to think better of myself. I'm going to graft that onto the tree of my life, right? And then we keep doing this over and over, pruning this part off that we don't like, adding this part, grafting this on that we do like. And what are we left with? Some kind of Frankenstein plant. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, not so beautiful. And you're like, oh, <laughs> look at me. <laughs> no, no probably doesn't feel very good too, right, to be that, that organism. <clears throat> but it's, um, let me get the words right, clearing away minute obstacles, utterly free from minute obstacles one comes to not know. Okay. So what are, what are these minute obstacles? <clears throat> This is, this is what we now call conditioning. Yeah. There's, not a, there's not a lot of use of any kind of word of conditioning, that, that term conditioning in the Zen literature. It's been, I think, extensively translated as conditions or conditionings in the primary, the Pali canon. 
the earlier Buddhist texts, but, but Zen doesn't use this word, doesn't have this language for conditioning. I think, it, I think it has something to do with the, specifically the Zen culture that emerged in China with the Taoist backdrop and then something about the, the Japanese, uh, did I say Japanese or Ch Chinese? I meant Chinese Taoism and that culture and then the Japanese culture that um, was the language of conditioning wasn't so much there. And I like that, but that's, that's how we can understand it is the, our, our deep karmic attachments to the way uh, we see the world and we see ourselves. Those karmic attachments that condition the way we see ourselves and the world that kind of organize the way we see the world and see ourselves. So these minute obstacles, it gets very subtle and very deep in terms of how we organize our experience, how we organize our self-sense. And um, I reflected uh, on Saturday during session and will again here, just how, how thick and deep these conditionings go for ourselves. It's often said that um, for those of you entering this path, maybe in the first few years, if you, if you really knew what you were getting into, you probably wouldn't do it. Because <laughs> we come in usually with some ideas about what our practice is going to be like. And we come to see that we actually have to give up much more than, than that. And it's harder than we thought, harder than we ever imagined. <clears throat> but it's also true that the gift and the liberation is far more wonderful than we can imagine as well. That's for sure. But this is, this is right at the heart of this particular expression of non-knowing non-knowing self, because Jizo asks Hogan, uh, why, are you, why are you doing this? You know, what's the matter of your pilgrimage? Why are you traveling around practicing, you know, going to all these monasteries and teachers? Why are you doing that? Right? So we all have our, we, we have our own answers to that, really. You know, we, we, we should um, investigate what our answers are to that. I've, I put it out during the session, you know, what's, uh, why are you here? And everyone here, you know, I'll put it out to you now. Why, why are you here? Why do you come to practice here? So after a few moments reflection, you know, something might come to you. <clears throat> I hope something does come to you. Right. And oftentimes, uh, what comes to, to us in practice is um, some form of, I, I want to relieve suffering. You know, I'm, I'm coming with an affliction that I feel that I want to relieve. And uh, perhaps there's also a yearning to uh, relieve suffering for others that goes, goes along with that. It's great. It's an excellent, excellent motivation for uh, entering this path. And at the same time, it's based on a certain understanding of what suffering is all about, where it comes from. It's actually based on a, perhaps a not a full understanding and a conditioned understanding of where that suffering is coming from. So you have ideas about that. <clears throat> and if you hold to those ideas, there's going to be a lot of pruning and grafting ahead. <laughs> right? <clears throat> I 
as ideas or the, can manifest as minute obstacles to your own freedom, to your own path of awakening. <clears throat> so the non-knowing, practicing non-knowing involves being conscious of your motivations, as conscious as you can of your motivations. Being as conscious as you can of your self-definitions, of who you believe yourself to be. <clears throat> And we have opportunities every day to investigate those things. Usually, the most potent opportunities to look at that are ones where we're off balance, when we're outside of our comfort zone. Because when we're, you know, in our comfort zone, and those, those definitions are sort of temporarily working, potentially. <laughs> so they aren't perhaps challenged or investigated. The practice of non-knowing self is always to turn in and investigate what's going on with me right now. Am I fully present? Am I fully present? <clears throat> Hogan's response to Jesus' question is so immediate. All of, all of these koans, it's always an immediate expression. And that's why when students come to me and those who are practicing koans with me, you know, the immediacy of the response is a big part of it. <clears throat> You know, as soon as sometimes as, as if you take one second to think about it, and I, I see that one second, I already know you haven't really, really seen it. <laughs> and I, over many years, uh, experienced that with my teacher, you know, going through hundreds of koans with him. You know, I knew that a moment's hesitation and mm, the bell was coming. <laughs> The bell was coming. He was very compassionate with me, so he would, he would, he would help me. You know, he wouldn't ring me right out the way some teachers, you know, did. It's like, no, no, come back, come back. Sometimes that happened, but he'd work with me as well. Yeah. What else? <clears throat> some, something else. I to... Oh yeah. So going back to. Master Jizo, who's, who's actually the, the master who said not knowing is most intimate here, in walking and sit, so he also said this um, as his teaching, in walking and sitting, just hold to the moment before thoughts arise. Look into it and you'll see not seeing. Then put it to one side. Hold to the moment before thoughts arise. Look into it but then put it to one side. So don't attach to that moment before thoughts arise. Don't attach to that. But you will experience the moment before thoughts arise with strong practice, zazen. When you direct your efforts, this is Jizo now, again. When you direct your efforts like this, rest does not interfere with meditation and meditation does not interfere with rest. This is really the most intimate. Okay. So, so often we create a division within ourselves. We're always creating all sorts of divisions within ourselves. But this is one that we can intimately connect with on the inside in our zazen. Okay. It's like, what's going on? Am I meditating or not? Am I meditating or not? <laughs> okay. That voice, which is evaluating practice. Okay. Right there is the knowing mind at play, which is really keeping you from being intimate with yourself. 
It's up there. Meditation rest. Put those aside and just be present with what's going on with yourself somatically and mentally as one. <clears throat> Don't position yourself <laughs> with an investment in the thought as the thinker of the thought and hold to that position. Let's really experience your present moment. That's intimacy. That's the intimacy. It's so, it's so fresh, right? To just say, ah, okay, I'm tired. Am I meditating or not? It doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. That's extra. Just be what you are. Be bored. Be tired. Be confused. Be agitated mind. Be anxious. Yeah, without an idea of what good meditation is. Yeah, so these, these, these obstacles are minute, because we can see when we look in the, in the real uh, magnifying glass of Zazen, we can see how those thoughts arise and how we're invested in those different viewpoints, right? And then we get off the cushion and we interact with people and, and it becomes much less conscious. We're much less aware of those things. So that all goes a bit below consciousness. But with practice, with practice, with practice, it becomes much more available to our consciousness. And then we can interact in large consciousness. I'm not going to say full consciousness, but we can have a lot of consciousness, a lot of awareness of the way these things are arising for us, the way they're, they're affecting us, moving through our body, affecting the way we see things, minute obstacles. And with practice, they, 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 they fall away, really do. And what's left is a real fresh, intimate experience of yourself, moment by moment, just accepting whatever it is that comes up. <clears throat> That's really intimate. That's really intimate. It's fully accepting yourself. Fully accepting yourself. You don't have to be a particular way. You don't have to be a particular person. And then somebody comes and asks, who are you? And in a fully grounded and fully self-accepting way, you can say, I don't know. Mm. That feels good. It feels good. <laughs> okay. okay, practice with full acceptance, full self-acceptance. Be intimate with self. <laughs>